For our next workshop, I would like to welcome Cher Mayor Lador and Jor Rimchala. I'll read a brief bio on each of the presenters and highlight information about their workshops. So Cher is the data science manager of the Document Intelligence Group at Intuit, a global leader in the industry of financial management software. Cher is the co-founder of Pi Data Tel Aviv Meetups, WIDS Tel Aviv Ambassador, and the co-host of Unsupervised, a podcast about data science in Israel, and gives talks at various machine learning and data science conferences and meetups. Cher holds a Master's of Science in Electrical Engineering and Computers with a major in Machine Learning and Signal Processing from Ben Gurion University. And next, we have information on, should have information on Joy. So Joy is a principal data scientist in the Document Intelligence Group and also at Intuit, leading the research and innovation on AI-driven document services. She is one of the organizers of KDD 2018 XAI Workshop and serves as a program committee and a reviewer at leading conferences, including ACL, EACL, and quite a few others. Joy holds a PhD in biological engineering from MIT with a focus on developing parameter estimation methods and modeling cell decision as a Markov process. With that in mind, let's also hear a little bit about the workshop that both Sharon and Joy will present for us. So the title of the workshop is How to Leverage Document AI to Simplify People's Financial Lives. As a part of this workshop, we will learn about the evolution of document intelligence and the generative AI era, built build user confidence and help with information extraction and become aware of SOTA document intelligence techniques. They will take questions throughout the presentation and ask the audience questions too. At the end, you can also submit questions after their talk through the Q&A panel. Those questions can also be sent to the presenters after the session and they will share resources. Please welcome Cher and Joy. Hello, great to great to see everyone and thank you for the lovely intro, uh, Lou. Uh, we're excited to be here today. Um, let me start sharing my screen. So um, uh, as Lou mentioned, I'm Shirmi Lador, Data Science Group Manager at Intuit, and I'm here with my colleague, uh, my wonderful colleague, Jory Mchala, Principal Data Scientist in our team. And we're going to share with you today the journey uh, we have been through with Document AI at Intuit in our goal to simplify people's financial life and how this journey has evolved and become so much better with the generative AI and how we got to where we are uh, today, um, which is the cutting edge uh, leading uh, industry uh, document AI. Um, and I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned uh, around this topic, even if you're not working on document AI, these technologies that we are using are basically relevant to a lot of other tasks we will we will talk about. Uh, so stay tuned. Um, to start talking about this topic, we wanted to first show you um, what does document AI even mean? Why it's important? Why do we need it? So let's start with a quick quiz. And please, we want your engagement. So please answer in chat. Um, anyone who knows what is this form? And this is an easy question. If you're from the US, I'm sure you've seen this form before. That's right, Deborah, this is a W-2. Um, and yeah, I see W-2 for taxes. I'm sure if you're in the US, you've seen this form before. Thank you, thank you for the live participation. So this is a W-2 tax form. It has information about the income, about the amount of taxes will held from your income, benefits provided. And for those of you here from the US, you probably know that every year you need to need to enter data from this form in order to file your federal and state taxes. Yeah, it's not a nice experience, but it's something everyone has to do every year. Um, anyone has any guesses? How long would it take you specifically to manually enter the data from this form for your tax filing. So just you know, throw your guesses out there. We just want to get some range of understanding. How much does it take you? Okay. Oh, great guesses. We have Himani with 10 minutes, Maduri with five minutes. This is 30 minutes. 
uh, Deborah, three minutes. Christine, 10 annoying minutes. Thank you, Christine. We have also five minutes and Catherine said two hours. Wow, that's a lot. Um, so Sabrasti said at least one hour or more. Okay, so there are great guesses there. Actually, when I checked about this in Google, Google said it could take between three to 20 minutes um, per form. And this could change. This could be even be longer as we saw um, from the answers in our chat. And it depends, you know, on the amount of information you have there, on your age, on your technical skills, how fast you type, and actually how tired you are that day, right? So let's think about that. Every year we have to uh, fill out that form for our tax filing. And um, there are at least five more forms we need to fill, if not 10. So let's take an average about seven and a half forms. There are something around 168 million households that need to uh, report on their taxes in the US every year. So if you sum all of this together, um, an average number would be 9 million days of manually entered data for tax filing. Whoa, that's a lot. Um, and as some people mentioned here, it's not a very nice experience. Now, um, another short question. What do you think is the probability to make an error when manually entering data? So let's try to think about this together. Uh, and I appreciate your answers in the chat here. You see, there are a little over 20 fields here. You see you have 20 fields, but some of them have subfields. And think about, you know, how can you make this calculation? Maybe what is the probability to make an error within one field? And then what is the overall prob to probability to make at least one error when you uh, manually enter data uh, from this form? Uh, oh, thank you, Shravasti. Zero, otherwise IRS will make life pretty hell. <laughs> I agree with that. Deborah says 25%. Oh, I see Andrew said, too much time. In Canada, the data for this type of form can be imported from the government tax revenue service directly. That's true. Some of these forms can be imported, but from our data, we see that a lot of people doesn't uh, import the data directly from their IRS, even in the US. Um, so a lot of people just upload uh, the information and need to actually manually enter it. Um, so uh, at least one or two errors. Okay, so these are Great question. So I've tried to kind of take a stab at it and say, well, if we take a conservative, um, sorry, if we take a conservative uh, um, assumption of 1% error per field, then the probability to have at least one error when we are filling, when we are manually entering data from this form would be 18%, which is Okay, not nice. And as Shrabasti said, it's not something you wanna you wanna have errors in your tax filing. If we go with a more realistic or a little bit more realistic, a, a three percent error a, per field, then we get to forty five percent that we will make at least one error when we are a manually a, entering a data from this a, tax form. Uh, which is almost 50%. We don't want to get there. We don't want to make errors in our tax filing. So the question is, how can we make sure there are no errors? And how can we make sure we don't spend all that time manually entering data? Well, ta-da, data scientist to the rescue. This is where AI comes into the picture. And this is where our team starts working. Um, so our mission is to deliver reusable AI to enable never enter data for our customers. So what does that mean? And who are our customers? Uh, for those who are not familiar with us, Intuit is an AI-driven expert platform uh, that serves over 100 million customers um, in its products. We have TurboTax, Credit Karma, QuickBooks, MailChimp, and many of these has forms like tax form or small business kind of uh, documents that needs a, a data to be extracted from. And this is what our team does. Our goal is to build AI services that can extract uh, and get required information from any document. And today we're gonna tell you a little bit about how uh, we evolve these kind of solutions over time and how we are leveraging generative AI for it. Uh, thank you, uh, Sushmita. Uh, love the graphic. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so um, let's look a little bit about, you know, what is the problem we are solving? In the end, let's say we'll take, we're getting a document from a customer uh, that's basically an image, an image of a document. That's what they have. Uh, as uh, someone uh, correctly said, you know, in some options, there are a way to import the data directly from the IRS or from financial institution. But unfortunately, it's not always the case. And in many cases, all that you have is just that image. And I can say in many cases, because we process millions and millions of documents like this every year for our customers. And um, so we need to have these capabilities. Um, so we get this input, uh, the document image, and then uh, most of the tasks we need to solve are things like one, being able to classify the document to say, what is the type of the document? For example, here, this is the tax form 1040. Um, this is helpful to um, rename, categorize the document, use it for the right purpose, use the right extractor for the document, the right capability to extract information from it, um, and for many other tasks. Um, and then we have the extraction, basically parsing the document, getting the required information in a format then a product can uh, use. Um, so uh, uh, to extract uh, information like the name, and, and the SSN, uh, all kinds of information you need for either, it could be for your tax filing, it could be for small business management, for bookkeeping, for payroll, whatever financial task you need to make. Um, you see, we can also uh, provide confidence for the extraction, how confident we are that we actually extracted uh, the right information so that the user would be able uh, um, to the, the basically the product can highlight to the user the the fields that we are less confident about so he can correct those um in that case um and i see i have uh, something in the in the chat uh, shravasti is saying we use TurboTax, and that means we are your customer in TurboTax, we scan the W-2 and it reads and fail all the forms really nicely and quickly done. Oh, that's so nice of you to say. Well, today you're going to understand how we're doing that. <laughs> um, thank you. It's really nice to hear from our customers. So the question is, what is in this um, in this box? What is the kind of technology you think? So Shabash, do you have an opportunity here to say what your guess is on how we are doing this? So I want to hear from you, uh, uh, our lovely audience here. What do you think is the technology we are using to get the required information from this document automatically? And, you know, feel free to guess. There could be, you know, many uh, possible options to solve this problem. Uh, let's see. Is it OCR? OCR. Oh, great, great, great question. Named entity recognition. Oh my God, everything is correct here. Computer vision. Hmm. Yes, yes, yes. More. I want to see more ideas, thoughts. CNN. Oh, this is great. We're actually, you know, checking all the boxes of the things we're going to cover. Yellow. <laughs> Computer vision. GPT-4 vision. Oh, nice. I like it. I like it. We're going to talk about all of these things. Assuming it's a workflow with multiple technologies. That's true. That's true. Okay. So I really loved your answers. Thank you so much for engaging with us. It's very helpful to see where you are and what you think about this space. So there are multiple ways to solve this problem. Mechanical Turk, thank you, Andrew. It's also a part of the process. Um, so one of the options would be to actually use an OCR service, as many of you mentioned here, but honestly, OCR service is not enough. What OCR service, oh, so sorry, something happened, it just jumped here. You saw all the future. Okay, so OCR service just brings us all the text from the image. But then, you know, from that text, you need to be able to answer a question. What is the type of this document? And, you know, the extracted information in a structured uh, format that we can actually consume uh, in the product. 
Um, and by the way, um, uh, what is OCR service? I'm, I'm assuming not everyone is familiar even with that technology. So just to give you the context of what that is, I'm sure that many of the people here has um, iPhones. Maybe you've noticed that um, when you take a picture with your iPhone, the iPhone automatically recognizes the text in the image. You can even copy paste uh, the text uh, in the image. Try it, try it at home. So this capability is called OCR, basically detecting the text in an image and um, being able to use it uh, as a text format and not in an image format. Yes, it's optical character recognition. Thank you, Renu. This is the right acronym. Um, so after we're getting the text, and by the way, there are multiple ways to get the OCR. You can, um, there are open source libraries that provide you OCR capabilities, and there are also paid services uh, that provide you OCR capabilities, like uh, from AWS or from Google. Um, we honestly, we use a paid service because we find it to be uh, more uh, accurate than what we get from the open source ones, but we are still looking to see how we can go more and more to open source services, uh, open source libraries, sorry. So after uh, we get the OCR text, we need to build some kind of a model uh, to get the um, answer to our question, the classification and the extraction of information from the document. And as you can probably imagine, because the input uh, to the model is a text input and the output is also text, though so this is some kind of an NLP model. Um, and we will talk in a minute about what are the kind of models you can put in here. It's basically going to be a, a large part of our talk. So this approach is called unimodal approach because you used only the text from the document. You, you take the image, translate it to text, and then build a text model. Um, the pros to the approach of using OCR and then going with a text model is that you can, uh, uh, the, the model is pretty simple because it works only on text, not on the image. So you have a lower instance cost. And the OCR, if it's a good OCR, it gives you a good reading quality of the text, as much of the OCR is good. And the cons is that you use an external service. So it increases your SLA if you call an external service and not a library. And it also adds maybe a third party cost and a dependency if they change anything in, in in the OCR and the output, you will uh, need to um, make changes and test as well. Um, and also another con is that you're not using, using the document layout information at all here because you're only uh, using the text. So another approach, which is also unimodal, um, is to uh, uh, use a model that leverages the image directly. Basically, it takes the image, and from the image, it brings you um, the type of the document or extract all the required information from the document. So as you can imagine, the pro here is that there is no OCR dependency or cost, and you can um, leverage both the text and the layout, um, but from the image itself. The cons is that the model would need to have a pretty good uh, pseudo OCR capabilities to recognize the text well. Um, and because the model would probably not have as good capab reading capabilities as an OCR, the extraction accuracy may drop in terms of uh, typos and recognition of specific characters. Um, also, you will have a bit of a higher instance cost because now we are handling images which are heavier. Um, and by the way, feel free to ask questions or, you know, make comments in the chat. Um, you know, we're loving this engagement that's going on with this lovely audience here. So the third option is to do multi-model, uh, which is honestly my favorite option, um, but it's also the most complex one. Uh, and that would mean using both the text and the image in the model. And then you have the OCR service that bring you the text and you also have uh, the information from the image. And both of these are going to the model, which uh, will have to be able to handle inputs of two types, both text and image. And then you are leveraging both the layout and text information with a higher accuracy. Um, the cons would be that you have the OCR service dependency again and higher complexity and instant cost. Um, 
so Adriana is asking, so the type of model used, i.e. NLP, LLM, et cetera, depends on the type of input and the desired output. Example, text input to text output is NLP. Yes, that's right. Text input to text output, that would be some kind of a text model and NLP model. Um, and we will see examples for that. Okay, so now we talked in a very high level of three, three different ways we can solve this problem. We will dive into the specific technologies and how we are fine tuning those and hint there is named entity recognition here and there is LLM and all of these uh, uh, lovely things would get to, uh, to us very soon. But now we want to take a step back and kind of go back to what I said in the beginning, which is how this kind of task of document understanding is related to other tasks that are out there in the world from AI and how all of these come together and how the evolution of AI is influencing how we are solving this problem. And for that, I will um, uh, hand the baton to uh, my lovely colleague here, Joy. Joy, you can take it. Yeah, Go thank on. you, sure. And if you don't mind uh, progressing the slide, I would appreciate that. So let's zoom out a little bit. So as you can see, um, we are able to get higher performance, higher accuracy on document understanding using information from different modality, including text, image, and layout. This um, document, the leveraging of multiple modality um, is not just uh, for document understanding, but there is a family of tasks that leverage similar kind of information. And um, I basically uh, show you a collection of this family of related tasks that require multiple modality of input, including visual relationship, visual question answering, uh, image understanding, image check matching, et cetera. So the advance in, um, in the field that try to improve on all of these tasks could benefit document understanding. And um, in the next slide, I will talk through um, a few key milestone pieces of technology that help accelerate uh, document understanding in generative AI era. So starting in 2017, Google Brain introduced Transformer, uh, which is a new kind of architecture that allow different uh, pieces of input. Uh, and this case is applied to NLP first. So different uh, element of text in the document to be able to attend to one another. And that helped revolutionize the field a lot, uh, starting in 2018 with BERT, which takes the encoder part of the transformer model and pre-train um, the model on a large web scale uh, corpus of data without any labels. So because it doesn't require labels, uh, you can pre-train a model with a lot of data. And uh, this model has been shown to achieve state of the art on uh, many NLP tasks. Um, and following that year, um, uh, researcher in the field have figured out how to add additional modality starting with layout. And these are basically bounding box coordinates of text in a document to build a multi-model transformer that solve document understanding and improve the performance. In the following year, 2020, um, um, there was uh, work in the community that figure out how to um, segment image or break down images into patches so that we could leverage the transformer architecture to capture image as an input. And the following that year, there are works on uh, combining text, layout and image and capturing element in the tech as a graph uh, and use all of those as an input to a model like the model that's sold for document understanding. So document understanding also uh, benefit from this technology. And the year 2022 and 23 is the year of generative AI. So, um, so in 2022, uh, the community have started using both the encoder and decoder to solve for document understanding and that the, the addition of decoder um, allows the model to become a generative model and to decode um, anything uh, that is, might not necessarily be part of the input. 
And in 2023, uh, we start seeing uh, the use of large language models and multimodal large language models in particular to solve for um, document understanding. And the really nice feature of large language model is that it has a large enough scale that is and it has been trained to be able to follow instruction. So it's very flexible to be adapted to multiple kinds of tasks. And it has the capability to learn in context. So we could provide demonstration and allow the model to be adapted to a uh, different kind of document understanding task. And we'll talk about all of these more in details in later slide, but I would like to transition back and give the stage back to Sher to talk about the technology we, we have built and how we transition through the years. Thank you, Joy, for this lovely um, uh, survey of um, the evolution of AI. And let's go back to a, the task we are solving for it, into it, and how this evolution influenced how we are solving this problem and the benefit it brought us to keep on, you know, uh, learning the top-notch technology and see how we can leverage those for the benefit of our customers. So let's look in how we solve classification before the generative AI era. So I think someone mentioned this actually here uh, in the chat as one of the options uh, to solve a uh, document understanding. And that's true. One of our first model was basically a CNN model. Uh, that's a computer vision model that takes the image um, and provide the classification uh, of the document. And how did we uh, train this model? So the model, um, was originally trained on ImageNet and data set. And then we did additional fine tuning on a public document data set. And then a second fine tuning on tax documents from our customers. So we can be able to uh, predict uh, in production accurately what is the type of document we are working in. So that was the first model uh, we developed. Um, and then we also went to using um, a text model uh, for classification. That one basically takes the image, um, go to a third party OCR, gets the OCR from the image. Then for each word, you apply TF-IDF to get the vector that represent that word in the space and apply logistic regression to get the answer um, of the uh, document type. So these two models are uh, uh, before the generative AI era. And these are both unimodal. One uses only the image, one uses only the text. Um, and uh, uh, after we started uh, leveraging generative AI, we basically looked at different technologies. And one of the most emerging one that Joy also mentioned in the evolution is Donut. Donut is document understanding OCR free transformer. So it uses the transformer technology. Um, it is a, 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 consists of a transformer encoder, which takes the image and um, gets the output of a vector that represents that image. The vector is then uh, taken as input to the transformer decoder. Um, and it, which gets an input also the type of task we would like to perform, whether it's classification or question answering or a parsing, uh, taking the um, extraction, extraction of the information from the document in a key value format. So either one of these tasks could be solved from the, with Donut, um, and then you can get the right output for it. We used it specifically uh, for classification. So we prompted um, uh, the decoder with the classification task, um, and then we get the output of the document type, um, and then you convert it to the format you want to get it uh, in the pro product. Um, and what this transition from um, the non-generative AI approaches to generative AI approaches, um, uh, the benefits it brought to us were higher accuracy and also ability to extend to new document type more easily. Um, and you can see the information on that model uh, on Hugging Face and the paper um, on archive. And I see, let's see, we have two questions or comments. 
What is RVL CDIP? So that's um, uh, that's from the previous slide. That's a data set, a public data sets of document. So we basically did a fine tuning on that data set to give the, the um, CNN model some prior information about documents in general and how to read those, and then additional fine tuning on our own uh, customer document. Um, and thank you, Joy, for, for answering the question for us in the chat as well. Um, oh, I think it went to the link. Uh, okay, going back. Um, okay, so this was classification. Let's talk about extraction, which is usually the more um, complicated problem to be solved here because there are multiple outputs going out of this model. And as we mentioned earlier, you wanna get everything uh, as accurate as possible to not uh, make errors in these, crucial, uh, in these crucial tasks. So we started solving this problem with non-generative AI because that's what was available back then. Um, and as someone noted here actually in the chat, we looked at it as a named entity recognition problem. What does that mean? How does that work? So um, for each document, and this is something we're also doing in classification, we are creating a label data set. Basically, we have um, um, labelers that work it into it um, and read the documents and get all the relevant information uh, from the document. Uh, and this is what we use to train our model. This is a supervised task. So we need the label data set. Um, but uh, in when we are training the model for named entity recognition, to get from these labels to what we are actually training the model with actually requires a lot of pre-processing. How does that look like? So you take the document, you get the OCR, and then the input to the model, the labels you get into the model is not this kind of label. Basically, you need to take the OCR and do something we call filter token label pro propagation, which means for each piece of text in the OCR, you need to um, provide the type of a, a label, the basically the, the class of that text. So if it's 2016 in the OCR, so you would need to provide also the fact that this is the tax year, this would be the label for that. Or if this is this number, this would be the wages amount, as you can see here. So this is the type of a label data set that uh, this uh, model would get. And the model would be some kind of an encoder model. Uh, you can use BERT or um, any uh, variation of BERT, the BERTA or Roberto, or, you know, there are many others. Um, and uh, the output would basically be, uh, the output from the model would be based on the OCR, you get the label uh, for each of the tokens. What is the, the label uh, of each of the tokens in the text? And then you need to do additional post-processing to get it in the format, in the original format, as we've seen in the labels, which is what uh, the product wants to consume, which is kind of a key value format. So as you can see, not a very simple approach, but this is what we had back then, right? Um, and is it not? Okay, so this is a highly specialized approach. It requires a model or a few model to cover each document type. And there is some limitation in the annotation because if you think about it, if you have a few of these numeric values that are um, from some reason happen to be equal, that it would be a challenge to, to give them a different label in the input. So you have an, a limitation in the annotation here. Uh, so this is uh, the, the um, named entity uh, recognition approach, a token classification problem. So now we'll see how we're solving uh, extraction with generative AI. Um, so uh, um, as we talked before, for uh, each and every one of our problems, we can solve it using the image directly, using the text from the OCR, or using multimodality. Um, so this is what we can see here, all of this variation. Uh, basically, we uh, take the image, 
Uh, if you're using only the image, you input that into an image encoder, as we've seen with Donut. The, this bottom example is basically a model, which is in the same architecture as Donut. You have an image encoder, you have the output vector, and then you feed that into a text decoder, which get also uh, the task as input, in this case is extraction or parsing. Um, and the output would be um, the, the structure, the data as you need it for the product. Um, the other option or the other two options would be to uh, go through an OCR and run it through a text model or run it to a multimodel, which takes the OCR um, and the image multimodal encoder, then you get the vector representation, and then you uh, run it through a text decoder, and you get the structured uh, output. I hope that makes sense to everyone, and feel free to ask questions in the chat if you have those. I'll just say that this approach is uh, much easier, because in this case, um, you don't need to do a lot of pre-processing on the data. Basically, um, you can feed the labels as uh, the original ground truth, this is the labels that you have. You don't need to do all of that pre-processing that we have done with the uh, OCR. Um, and the output is just generated text. It basically generates new text, is not taking the original text and giving labels to each of the tokens like we saw with the named entity recognition. Um, so this provides a much more general approach um, it, it gives us flexibility that one model can cover multiple forms at the same time. So we have a lot more scalability here and we have a lot of forms to cover, honestly, and a lot of documents to, to extract information from. And it also, as I mentioned, requires less data processing and no annotation limitation uh, because you generate new text in the output. So let's see what are the questions in the test. To make sure I understand, parsing is the algorithm that gives the text encoder model instruction to desired output. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. I think the algorithm that gives the text. Parsing is like a cinnamon for me to uh, extraction. It's the same. It, it, it's the same task. Just getting the structured output from the document. Um, so I, I hope I um, understood the question. Um, the other question I see here that I understand more is. Do you still need to rely on annotation for validation? Definitely, we still need, uh, you know, this this um, a, a graph is actually missing this part, but definitely we still do the same. We still do annotation. Uh, we, still do, we still do labeling. We get the ground truth. We have a data set with the ground truth and we fine tune this architecture, this encoder decoder. So um, given the input, it will provide the output, which is generated text, which would be uh, the same as the ground truth we have. And the ground truth would uh, look like, um, like we saw here exactly the same, but this time it's just generated text. You don't go through this stage here. This would be the type of output we get um, like this. Joy, do you wanna add something maybe on the Adriana question to make sure I got it right? Yeah, I think you addressed it pretty okay. much. Yeah. Okay, if, if uh, you wanna clarify a question, Adriana, if I didn't answer it well, Please, you know, you can ask again differently. Maybe I'll understand better. Um, okay, so to summarize in terms of the benefit, um, oh, I see Adriana um, just uh, asked, I'm trying to understand the practical difference between algorithms and models and how they work together. Um, so I think algorithm is just this list of um, actions to perform by a computer and a model is a machine learning model um, that we are fine tuning and training. So, and I think algorithm is a more general name. So um, I'm not sure it's it's very relevant is for, yeah, it's a more wider definition I think than here. So to summarize, we are, a, a, we moved basically from non-generative AI to generative AI. And in this transi transition by, you know, riding the most recent waves of technology, we were able to move from multiple specialized models per form 
uh, to one generic model that can even cover multiple forms at once, we moved from having annotation limitations uh, to ability to extract all entities, even if they have the same values. We moved from where OCR error can propagate to output because basically you are very, you are directly dependent in the OCR uh, outputs as we saw. We are uh, using directly the OCR uh, provided by the OCR uh, service um, in the output uh, for the customer. Uh, where in generative AI, we are generating new text based on the input of the OCR. So it can potentially correct OCR errors. Um, we are moving from five weeks, about five weeks to train a model to one or two weeks to train a model, just because it's so much simpler and uh, 1,500 lines of data processing codes to two, uh, 20 lines of data processing codes. Um, we do need to uh, optimize the generative AI so it can meet production SLA, because as you can probably imagine, and for those of you who use our product, you, you, you will need to be able to uh, provide an answer your, to your customer fast enough so they won't give up. Um, so we have some kind of a production SLA. So we did uh, some um, uh, uh, optimization to make sure we are running in a decent time for our customers. So just, you know, a couple of seconds um, and not in a too high of a cost of an instance, which is always a trade-off. I don't know what this happened. Sorry about that. Um, and we also uh, earned higher accuracy. That's right. We were able with all of this simplicity to gain much higher accuracy, which is pretty awesome because this is our overall goal that our customers would not see a lot of errors in our extraction because we want to get everything right. Um, SLA, oh, I see the question SLA. SLA is a service level agreement. Um, how do you make sure the Gen AI model does not hallucinate? Oh, that's a great question. I think Joy will probably talk a little bit more about this because we're going to hit, this was our first wave of generative AI and Joy is going to touch upon the more, the more recent evolution for generative AI, which is actually using a really big generative AI models or in their other name, LLMs. Um, what language do you use to write all the code? Python. Yes. We use Python. <laughs> um, are there any disadvantages to the generative AI approach? Um, well, one disadvantage is that it requires optimization. So that's more work. Um, besides that, I actually think there are no disadvantages, but maybe Joy can come up with others. Um, yeah, but I think it has been mainly positive for us. Do you have any any thoughts of other disadvantages be, besides the fact that we need optimization to make it run in good time and, and low cost? When you say customers and SLA, who are the customers? Okay, Joy, do you want to answer the disadvantages questions before I go to the next one? If you have I, any I, other... think, um, I think we touch upon this um, hallucination is one problem. So mm -hmm. for a smaller model, it's easier to detect. And for a larger model, it's a little bit more difficult. I think our, uh, our team uh, have for extraction, it's relatively easy to detect, especially in the context of multiple models. Our team has uh, leverage confidence, which is something that we are not going to be able to cover in this talk as a way to uh, determine whether the model is likely to hallucinate or not as well as a notion of consistency, meaning look at looking at the agreement of extraction between different models or different model inference as a way to minimize hallucination. That's a great point. Thank you, Joy. And just to answer the other question that went on the chat, and then we just go to, to Joy because that's the really most interesting part of the talk. Um, when you say customers and SLA, who are the customers? The customers are the customers that are using TurboTax, trying to file their taxes in, in, in the end of the year, or customers that are using QuickBooks and trying to manage their small businesses or to do um, bookkeeping for the small businesses or trying to do payroll 
uh, for their small businesses. So all different use cases where people need us for financial tasks. These are our customers. And as mentioned, we have over 100 million customers using uh, our products. Okay, so moving on to Joy, who will talk about LLMs for document understanding. Yeah, so this year is the year of large language models, starting with the announcement of GPT-4 since um, April or March uh, this year. So our team has been working really, really hard on trying to um, figure out how we could adopt large language models for document understanding. Uh, what we really like about large language model is its ability to learn from uh, providing instruction and learning in context by providing just a few demonstration. This will really help us solve for documents where we we really have a hard time acquiring some labels because it's like very laborious to get labels or the document are just like very rare. So in the next slide, I'd like to show you how we adopt large language model, both a uh, unimodal and multimodal for document understanding. So uh, we leverage the ability of the model to learn in uh, context um, and um, with uh, instruction. So when we try to train a model to do extraction, for example, or uh, classification, um, we basically need to provide, um, need to construct an input in a specific way that allows the model to, to learn to generate the output. So in this case, uh, we uh, explore both text-only model and multimodal models, which I'll go over in details in the next slides. But uh, the way we uh, construct the input to train the model is basically we have a human tag, which indicate to the LLM that this is um, the input coming from um, outside, not the task that the LLM need to solve. So uh, we provide an instruction, for example, for extraction, it would be uh, asking the LLM to extract all the possible field from a document. We take the document image, uh, calling OCR to get the raw text and inject the OCR text as part of the input text in, in the human part. And then uh, we add the assistant tag, which indicate that anything that comes after this is the task that the LLM is trying to solve. And uh, we put the ground truth in a structure format um, uh, as part of the entire input. And then by using the special token human and assistant, the LLM knows that anything that comes after the assistant tag is the task that the LLM is trying to learn. So for the text only model, we use the open source uh, Llama 2 model, which come from uh, Meta. For the uh, multi-model model, we add the image uh, as part of the input to the model. And the way we, do, we did that is, we used a visual encoder coming from Vision Transformer. And the visual encoder basically take the raw image, break them down into a, a series of patches, and then embed individual patches into a vector that is projected into the token space. And by, uh, con by uh, providing the image, um, the image could be concatenated or image token, I should say, could be concatenated to uh, the input to the LLM. And this is how we are able to use multimodal input uh, for training a multimodal large language models. So what we really like about Llama in the next slide is, so the Llama model is trained uh, with multiple rounds of uh, human feedback using reinforcement uh, learning with human feedback. And uh, it started with taking the Llama 1 model and using self-supervised uh, learning to get to the Llama 2 model um, with a lot more data than the Llama 1. Also on top of that, after we get the initial Llama model, um, the team at Meta basically use supervised fine tuning with RLHF or reinforcement uh, learning with 
uh, human feedback where uh, they basically uh, provide the input and allow the Llama 2 chat model to generate multiple outputs and then feed that to the humans. And then the human would rank um, the output based on two criteria um, simultaneously. One is for safety, uh, which rates how safe uh, or non-toxic or harmless uh, the output from the LLM is. And then also helpfulness, um, which is uh, a rating of how helpful or how um, following of instruction the output from the LLM is. And based on that, um, the output the, and, the, and the rating is provided back to the model to integrally fine tune uh, the model. So it's become like really, really increasingly helpful and increasingly safe. So because of this iterative um, RLHF, we think that Llama 2 is uh, really safe and really easy to use. So we went with that model. And for the uh, la for the multi-model model, we adopt the Llama model. And the Llama model is, oh, sorry, the Lava model is a, a framework, I should say, that combine the visual modality with the language model. So the language model part could be any language model, including large language model like Llama 2 or any others that, um, has the ability to follow instruction and learn in context. So the LAMA, the LAVA training involves two stage. One is to align the feature coming from the visual modality via visual encoder and the mod, uh, and then the language model. And the way we train is uh, is that we do not need label in this case. So we take the image and train the model as if it's doing image captioning. And in our case, we use the OCR text as a caption for a document image. Um, during the first stage training, we only train the projection layer, which works uh, to align the uh, input coming from visual encoder and then um, the output to the language models. Uh, after the stage one training, we considered a the model to be aligned across modality and also adapted to document domain. Then we, we then we take the the train projection layer and use it to train uh, the second stage. And the second stage is about adapting the model to the type of instruction, the type of output that we expect the model to do. For example, we would like to train the model in stage two to be able to follow the instruction around. Uh, inferring the type of document and uh, extracting key information from the document. So the instruction would be extract all the document and provide document type and the output would be the structured uh, JSON that represent the document type and the key information in key value format. And in the stage two, we allow both the projection layer and the language model part to be tunable because the language model has to additionally learn how to follow instruction and output the output in the format that we want. Uh, what we really like about the LAVA model is that it's achieved the state of the art performance on science QA benchmark, and it beats GPT-4 uh, in this benchmark. So um, with this model, we are able to, to add um, additional modality into um, the multi uh, large language model. And we found that from um, internal experiment, this model performed better than uni model. So in the next slide, I think this is basically um, some example of our first experiment with LAVA. This is even before we try to fine tune it. So uh, what we found is, uh, so we provide an instruction to extract all the fields from this document and this model at this stage has not been trained on this document. And it's able to output 
uh, pretty in, um, accurate information from majority of the field, even without fine tuning. So we further fine tune this model to follow the instruction better and output the format in a way that is easier to parse. So after fine tuning, the model performed even better than this, you know, zero shot performance. And we continue to use mechanism to generate labels for document that we do not have label for, and it ha has helped us save a lot of time and effort into creating um, label data for documents, especially for documents that have a lot of information in them. So um, to sum up, uh, we start from small generative AI that is easier to deploy and scale um, it's also more inference efficient than LLM and it's the small generative AI hallucinate less. And the hallucination coming from small generative AI is easier to detect. And the reason why we say it's easier to detect is when the model start hallucinating, it start generating gibberish, which is really, really easy to, to detect using just language detection. We would know that, you know, it's hallucination. Large language model has been trained on a lot more uh, natural language data. So it's much more powerful and it's very flexible to be adapted to new tasks, multiple tasks, more challenging, and um, can learn from, you know, changing prominent instruction. It's also somewhat like sensitive to prominent instruction too. So there is uh, additional, um, work that need to be done in terms of optimizing the prom and instruction. But once uh, the prom and instruction are optimized, this model works really well. Um, the strength of large language model is its ability to learn in context, which could be really useful for generating labels. But the uh, disadvantage of large language model is that it's hallucinate quite a bit more and hallucination in large language model is a little bit more challenging because um, the output, uh, the hallucinated output still look very much like natural language and it's just harder to detect. And our team has been working on leveraging the notion of um, content score and consistency to try to detect hallucination more efficiently and uh, also trying to train a model to hallucinate less. Um, that's pretty much um, my part. And so to sum up, um, we've been able to leverage the evolution of generative AI to accelerate uh, document understanding capability uh, in terms of boosting accuracy um, and in terms of sc scalability, we can build one model that could tackle multiple tasks rather than having several specialized model, which helps us a lot in terms of um, deployment management and um, efficiency, operation efficiency. Um, and by leveraging the scale of generative AI up to the scale of large language model, these models are more flexible to adapt to new tasks and could be, uh, could be trained to do useful tasks with less labeled data. And we found that leveraging multi-modality with more information like from document layout or the image allows the model to um, have to, to you accurate, uh, more accurate in uh, extraction than using uni modality alone. And I think that's pretty much all we have. And we have, I think we have some time for Q&A. So thank you so much to both Joy and Cher for your workshop. That was excellent. I think this resonated a lot with the audience members based on the application. And of course, the uh, you know, technical expertise that was demonstrated. So thank you both so much. And time-wise, we do have questions because you answered so many questions already. I see that there are two questions in the Q&A panel. Let's take one of those questions. And then for the other one, we can probably answer offline if that's okay. But here's here's one of the questions that I think that may be helpful for the, you know, entire audience. So the person asked the following question, to get into data science slash machine learning, do you have to know all of these packages and models? Which ones are the important ones to focus on? 
this is a pretty large question, but it may be helpful to the audience members. Joy, do you want to take it? Yeah, I, I can try and then sure, feel free to chime in. So um, I don't think you need to know all the packages out there because there are a lot. I think um, usually uh, when we get into data science, we maybe focus on a family of problems and knowing um, the tools and packages that help us solve uh, that family of problems would be a good starting point and then you can branch out. Usually um, people start in data science being somewhat general, like you know, knowing scikit-learn and knowing pandas and uh, packages that allows us to um, basically manipulate data and um, train models. Like uh, I think that's good enough uh to start with and then later on you specialize into different fields like nlp and computer vision um time series modeling then you usually pick up like a more specialized skills and also learn more about specialized package for that particular field but to start with uh you know you just need to know like things that are more domain general do you have anything else to add sure i think that's that's my experience. I think you you covered it, Joy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joy. And I know that it is 10 a.m. Pacific time, which is the time for the start of the next workshop. So there are a few questions related to your workshop, and at least one of them is in the Q&A panel, and one of them is in the chat. So if you have a few minutes, please feel free to reply offline. If not, we can send you those questions. So please just let us know which option you prefer. But thank you once again to Cher and Joy for sharing the technical expertise with us. We can't wait to see those resources as well that you share with the WIDS community. Thank you once again for your wonderful workshop. Music